Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Hills, the Scientific Director for Separation Science, and I'd like to welcome you all to our latest webinar in collaboration with Wyatt Technology. Our topic today is characterization of polymeric excipients with size exclusion chromatography and light scattering. Let me introduce our presenter for today's webinar. Andy Mayer completed his PhD in Applied Science Polymer Chemistry from the College of William and Mary in Virginia. His doctoral research centered on life monitoring of high performance polyamides used for offshore oil recovery, employing SEC MALS for molar mass characterization in parallel with viscometry, rheometry, tensile testing, and other mechanical testing of the bulk polymers. Dr. Mayer joined Wyatt Technology in 2001, serving for several years as an application scientist, then as Dean of Wyatt's Light Scattering University and as Director of Customer Service and Support. Currently, he is responsible for sales and support in Wyatt's Southeast region, introducing Wyatt's innovative technologies there, determining which instruments best match customer requirements and ensuring complete customer satisfaction with all of Wyatt's products throughout the region. And so, without further ado, I'll turn the presentation over to Andy Mayer. Andy? Well, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And, you know, I'd also like to thank my colleagues and collaborators here in the US, uh, particularly three people, Dr. Jason Lin, Dr. Michelle Chen, and Dr. Mark Spears all of uh, Wyatt Technology, all of whom contributed to the preparation of this webinar. Um, that is not me on, the, <laughs> on this slide. Uh, that's Dr. Philip Wyatt, um, founder, CEO of, of Wyatt Technology, who I'd also like to thank. Dr. Wyatt and his company um, have, have really made multi-angle light scattering what it is today. And I think, you know, the, the scientific community, whether we realize it or not, you know, we've all greatly benefited from, from Dr. Wyatt's efforts creating this space, you know, creating this technology. Um, someone has uh, once called him the most interesting man in light scattering. I, I think that's a nice title, but, uh, but thanks to Dr. Wyatt. Anyhow, today what we're going to do is we're going to review the benefits of light scattering and related techniques for polymer characterization. Um, and along the way, we'll touch on a few technical strategies for this type of analysis, um, really focusing on and centering on uh, applications from industry and academia um, related to these you know, polymeric excipients. Um, you know, and here we have a, a diagram of a, you know, some sort of deliverable drug. And, and we see here um, you know, those of us in the industry know well the, the critical importance of these polymers in drug delivery. Uh, they might represent, you know, the vast majority of the, of the mass percent by weight, um, you know, of a, of a final product, you know, the, the release polymers, the protective coatings and so forth. Um, and I'll give you all here a chance to read the quote if, if you haven't already. Um, this study is just one of many, many examples showing how polymers make it possible to deliver effective doses of various uh, drugs regardless of their solubilities. And m more than that, you know, we realize that key factors in excipient processing are, you know, of course, the ability to ensure consistency and, and stability over the entire processing um, regime, you know, over, over making these products. But but also, you know, over the shelf life of the product, we have to make sure that these polymers are stable and consistent. And so I have a lot of customers who are, you know, looking at uh, aging studies and whatnot. And so we'll t we'll touch on some of these topics. All of this is pointed at um, the, the behavior, the again the drug release, the stability of these products, and in a very particular way, we know that the molecular weight is a central parameter that governs, you know, both the, the microscopic and the macroscopic behavior of these materials. 
Um, and that's the point that we should stress here is that from you know raw strength and durability of the bulk material um, all the way down to like we see here these you know erosion rates and release rates in vivo um, the molecular weight is that property that ultimately drives a lot of the behavior uh, of these polymers um, you know and again in industry we historically have used you know a variety of methods uh, to characterize these materials um, bulk viscosity tests and density tests uh, have been very popular um, but these of course measure the, the macroscopic characteristics of these materials and as such you know these these methods might miss uh, or, or I should even say even worse they might mask or hide some underlying microscopic properties, um, properties that can be measured directly, um, and and by the way at a, at a reasonable cost uh, by size exclusion chromatography and light scattering. So in other words, what we see is that systems that might have identical bulk viscosities or behave in similar ways, you know, in a viscometer and such, might actually have very different underlying microscopic properties. Um, and so that's our goal here is to seek the ability to relate the microscopic properties of these systems um, and, and that's what truly governs the behaviors of these excipients and, and we'll give a nod to cellulose you know in, in particular in this area um, it's a, just such a classic example a lot of the folks that I meet from industry tell me that their source materials uh, such as you know various types of cellulose can vary uh, by supplier, you know, and from lot to lot. And so, um, you know, as we see in the quote that you know, the, the ability to determine the molecular weight, again, in particular, and the, uh, the polydispersity or the chemical uniformity is, is absolutely crucial um, for this type of work. So, you know, just as a first quick example, you know, tying this all together, um, you know, we see three batches of hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose uh, you know HPMC from an undisclosed source and you know first characterized by bulk viscosity um, and we had you know sample one with a much lower viscosity while samples two were were more similar um, interestingly when we dig deeper and measure a weight average molecular weight we have a little surprise waiting for us in that third lot right we actually have a lower molecular weight uh, despite the higher viscosity yeah, how can that be um, you know if it really is the the molecular properties that are driving the bulk viscosity you know this just doesn't add up does it well when we crack open the molecular weight distribution you know as we saw in the previous slide it's not just the the molecular weight but it's also the the molecular weight distribution that's critical um, we see that that sample three has a much broader distribution of sizes present. Um, there's some high molecular weight content in there. And so in other words, we see that the average bulk viscosity number um, you know, has really been affected by the polydispersity in a particular way that might not have been anticipated just looking at the average MW. So what's the point? Well, the point is, is no single number you know and especially not a bulk average you know in either of these cases will tell the whole story uh, about a polymer and about uh, its suitability you know no no one number will predict um, its performance going forward so we we strive to you know to get at this molecular weight and, and at this polydispersity to really begin to to put more pieces of the puzzle to. Um, and I'll, I'll i'll mention you know we should make no mistake here uh, measuring the molecular weight of cellulose uh, in, in particular um, is, a, is a challenge. Um, the technical workings of the light scattering will be what we focus on. Um, but I, I have to admit, I, I did chuckle a little bit as I read uh, Kashik quoting Oberlerkner. So we have you know, a litany of, of researchers over the years who agree that um, this molecular weight of cellulose issue uh, is something that that polymer chemistry has struggled with for just about as long as anybody can remember um, you know literally hundred a couple hundred years that you know, people have been struggling with this 
Um, and it's not just cellulose. I, I mean, just last week I was chatting with someone who was attempting to do some mass spec work for uh, some uh, saccharides. And, you know, she mentioned how difficult it was to get her compounds to ionize. And, and actually what was worse yet about that particular situation is that it seemed like it was the higher molecular weight compounds, um, you know, there were the higher molecular weight portion of, of, the, of the samples that she was measuring, which, you know, were, were most difficult to run in mass spec, you know, most difficult to ionize. But in addition to that, those high molecular weight compounds were the ones for which the molecular weight and branching structure were of greatest interest. Okay, so in other words, the, the higher molecular weight samples were the ones that really needed to be studied and also happened to be the ones that wouldn't run on the mass spec well. So we really need some tools to be able to address all manner of molecular weights for these polymers. Um, conventional uh, size exclusion chromatography or, or, or gel permeation chromatography um, is one of our stalwarts. And so here's a diagram of a basic you know, GPC system. And you know, we have our pump and our injector and our column or columns. And then we have a RI detector here uh, as a, a you know, refractive index detector as a concentration detector. And we've injected a series of standards, um, say known polystyrenes or what have you. And we can construct a calibration curve uh, based on the elution time using the apex of the peak of the elution of each sample. Um, we end up with a, a polynomial fit you know, going through these points. And this approach has been used for decades, right? Now, and what I hear from folks who are still doing this type of column calibration work routinely is, is typically two things. You know, one is that it's, it's done for historical reasons. It's, it's what reviewers or customers want to see because it's what they've always seen. Um, and and that, that does make sense. The second response that I get from folks can be a, a bit stunning in certain situations, which is when we're told that that's perfectly justifiable scientifically, you know, and that is to say they'll blindly believe that this technique works fine, um, that the elution of the unknowns is probably close enough to the elution behavior of the size standards. Um, and so in other words, you know, if you calibrate your column with something that you are pretty sure is similar to your unknowns, you can't go wrong, right? You know, that's, that's good enough. Um, not always the case, not always the case. And we'll look at an example or two here. Um, you know, this is, this is an example of a polystyrene standard, um, you know, 30 kilodalton uh, standard. We have the uh, refractive index trace here in, in sort of light blue. And then from the calibration curve, we have the molecular weight uh, point. So this is actually a series of dots coming down here. It looks like a line, but it's a series of, of molecular weight points. Um, you know, looks good enough, right? You know, anything eluding off the column is probably smaller, um, reasonably Gaussian peak, no reason to assume that the, um, you know, that there's any problem with the chromatography. How can we check this work? You know, how can we go in and verify that this is you know, correct? Uh, well, add a light scattering detector uh, to actually measure the molecular weight, right? And so again, and here are the same molecular weight results from the column calibration, but now in red, we've overlaid the results from the light scattering detector in line, okay? And notice something really important here, that the blue column calibration points necessarily steadily decline over the course of the peak because they follow that column calibration curve, right? But the light scattering results don't. They're, you know, they're largely stable over the peak. And so, you know, what's up with that? You know, the, the, the column calibration technique, you know, necessarily dictates that anything eluding later has to be smaller. It must be smaller in molecular weight. But the light scattering detector has no such predestined results. So we have the ability to actually measure the molecular weight of each part of our prop, uh, each part of our polymer without regard to elution time. Okay, so we can truly measure a narrow polydispersity by SEC malls 
Whereas by conventional calibration, you know, we have a sort of built-in polydispersity. You know, the, the sample is predestined to be a, a, a broader standard than it truly is um, if we run by column calibration. So this is one of the classic limitations of, of column calibration. And you know, we should take a few moments here to explore how this MALS result is actually calculated, um, how this works in the lab. Um, and, you know, again, many of us uh, here today already have um, some sort of working knowledge of multi-angle light scattering. So I am going to move relatively quickly here. Um, if you'd like more information about this theory, there's a ton of material uh, on our website and, and in some other sources. Um, but in any event, what we do is we, we shine a laser at the mobile phase flowing through this flow through cell here. And we can monitor the light scattering intensity at several fixed angles, you know, all around the cell. So there might be detectors in, in many different places here. Um, we see the, this schematic on the left and, and this actual you know, picture of the flow through cell on the right with inlet port and an outlet port. Um, that light scattering intensity that we measure, we often refer to as I, you know, the scattered light intensity. And it's proportional to, among other things, these three primary terms. This C is very, very easy to grasp. This is the concentration of our polymer. Uh, so we, we will need a concentration detector uh, in line. That's typically the refractive index detector. I'll, you'll hear me call it an RI detector. Uh, but we need some sort of concentration measurement. And we have this DNDC value here, the uh, specific refractive index increment. Um, the easiest way to think of this is the refractive index difference between the polymer and the solvent. Um, so the polymer and the solvent have dissimilar refractive indices and, and that is uh, quantified by this DNDC value. You can sometimes look it up uh, in the literature or you can measure the DNDC with that aforementioned uh, refractive index detector. Um, and so that's it. So we have I, which is measured, uh, concentration, which is measured, and the DNDC, which we know or look up. And to keep it simple, the molecular weight just drops right into our lap. Um, this, uh, this is the weight average molar mass. And, um, you know, it's, it's, this is a simplified version of the, of the light scattering equation, but this is the, the basics of, uh, of how it works. So why multi-angle? You know, if, if I is proportional to MC and D and DC squared, why do I need multiple light scattering intensities? Well, the, the trick here is that if the, if the molecule is smaller than about 10 nanometers, you know, given our, our red laser, given the wavelength of the laser, um, any molecule or particle smaller than 10 nanometers will scatter isotropically. Um, you know, in other words, this gray ball here is intended to convey that the scattering is even emanating in all directions from this uh, from this molecule or this particle. But at larger sizes, we have anisotropy introduced in the scattering pattern. So we have a much stronger scattering manifesting in the forward direction and a weaker backscattering signal. So depending on where we are in this spectrum, the multi-angle you know, gives us two advantages. One, if we're larger than 10 nanometers, we have to measure at multiple angles in order to capture this angular fingerprint so we can properly uh, calculate the molecular weight. Um, but also even below 10 nanometers, multiple angles of light scattering gives us a precision. Um, and there are some subtleties in terms of noise and, and some other things that happen that we very greatly benefit from having three or more detectors active uh, in this type of system. Uh, so be careful, not all light scattering detectors are created equal. Um, so when we add this light scattering detector to our GPC system, um, we end up with something very similar. So if, if you've never done this before, um, I often tell folks, really, you don't have to change much, if anything, about your chromatography um, in order to make this work. Um, you know, more often than not, you can just add the light scattering detector downstream from your existing system and, and keep it rolling. Um, here we also added a UV detector that's purely optional. Um, a UV absorbance detector as another possible concentration detector, uh, light scattering, and then always uh, the, the RI detector last. 
this would this type of setup will work with any uh, GPC system. Uh, we can work at room temperature. We can work at elevated temperatures. We can work subambient. Um, just about any mobile phase. Uh, just about any condition. Um, and so we, have, uh, you know, customers who interface with uh, any type of GPC. This is a Waters auto sampler pictured here, but um, just about any platform will work. Um, in particular, to make your life easy, we have a, uh, a technical note that will describe how to import your Empower sample set directly into Wyatt's Astra software. So that makes the, um, the operation a lot easier. We also have the ability to directly control an Agilent HPLC. So if you have a 1200 series uh, Agilent or an 1100 series Agilent even, um, we can control this, this hardware directly from our software. So you have a truly turnkey all-in-one solution. And there might be a handful of you out there who are working with uh, polymers that uh, you know, are, are only stable in solution at high temperature. We do have a high temperature SEC MOLS solution. Um, and so here's a picture to Toso Ecosec high temperature, truly uh, multi-angle system. There are several light scattering platforms floating around out there, um, but this is the only truly multi-angle uh, light scattering platform for high temperature use. So uh, if you're interested in that, let us know. In any event, um, let's put all this into action and look at some, some polymer excipients. You know, sodium alginate is a very commonly used uh, gel in, in pharmaceutics. And here we see a sample that we ran on size exclusion um, with the light scattering uh, and, and RI. We have the RI trace here in blue. And we also have a viscometer. I haven't talked about an inline viscometer yet. We'll do that in just a second. Um, but notice here, there's some subtleties that are, that are critical. Um, the RI detector is necessarily a little ways downstream from the other detectors. It's, it's a different instrument. It comes a little later. And so there's going to be this delay in the elution of your sample through the RI detector. Um, we will later align this data to the other two peaks and also use our patented uh, correction algorithm to bring these traces together. Um, can, can you imagine how critical that is? Um, for example, in the, in the equation I showed earlier where light scattering is proportional to M times C, well, for heaven's sake, you're going to divide this red chromatogram by this blue chromatogram, okay? So matching up this data is absolutely critical to accurate processing of this data. Um, so anytime you're doing this work, um, I would encourage you to be very, very careful um, about the alignment and the inter-detector broadening that may be taking place and being sure to treat that properly. It has huge implication. I would not want to do this type of work uh, without having a, an effective uh, and robust correction algorithm in place. Um, so this view shows an overlay from four repeat injections of the alginate. This is um, you know, four RI traces, uh, just for comparison's sake here. And we see the, the molecular weight results overlaid, very nice reproducibility. We have this really nice linear elution. The column's working beautifully. Um, but there's some non-ideality over here on the right. There's this uh, curve up due to well, some effect that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and so we'll get there. But otherwise, largely, this, this separation looks wonderful. Um, for, for a comparison study, we ran some pectin. And again, here's the a similar um, detector overlay. We're seeing the delay in the RI detector data coming up much later. And this will need to be aligned and the inter-detector broadening will meet, need to be addressed in order for this data to be processed properly. Um, well, let's just go ahead and overlay everything here. And we have a few little surprises in here, okay? So we see that you know, overall, you know, the pectin, we have a nice linear region here, just like we did for the sodium alginate. Um, we also see the non-ideality on the right. But, um, you know, notice how different the molecular weight results are for these two samples across the peak, even though they were run on the same column. Um, we see much higher molecular weight results for the pectin at any given time. 
um, you know, we have for the for the pectin 140 kilodaltons, um, whereas the alginate only came out around 110. You know, if you were to look only at these RI traces, you know, the, even the trained chromatographer might have surmised that the alginate would be bigger, you know, would be a higher molecular weight because it what? It has an earlier elution time, right? In GPC, we know that these polymers elute earlier when they're when they're larger. Um, but in reality, we see from the light scattering data that um, it's actually the pectin that has a higher molecular weight. So we know to be careful not to rely only on the RI trace, right? Um, we also have to wonder about this late eluding high molecular weight content here. Um, you know, again, looking at these these traces, I mean, those peaks look reasonably Gaussian. You know, there's no reason to expect that there's any high molecular weight content over here, again, just based on the RI data alone. If anything, we might guess that there's some lower molecular weight content that was that was coming out later. So, you know, what is this material? Why, you know, why do we have something um, higher in molecular weight coming out later? You know, this is this is classic light scattering result troubleshooting. Your first thought you know, could be, well, if the size exclusion chromatography is working, maybe these are smaller molecules that have somehow a higher molecular weight. Um, I don't know how that would be possible. Maybe they're very, very dense. You know, so even though they're physically smaller, um, maybe they have a higher molecular weight. Well, let's look at sizes then, right? And remember, light scattering can calculate both a molecular weight and a radius. And look at this. When we look at the radius results, we do see that some larger molecules, physically larger molecules, are truly eluding later. So we have a, a built-in check system here to some extent. Um, we're going to come back to this in a minute. I want to focus on the, the the more perfect part of the of the elution, this linear part, and show what we can do with the the excellent part of the curve anyway. And what that is is we can make a, a radius versus molecular weight conformation plot. Okay, um, we're going to relate the physical size of the molecules to the molar mass, and we're going to see how they grow with increasing units of mass. And you know, this plot confirms exactly what we expected, um, exactly what we thought was happening in, in some of the previous slides that the pectin has a much, much more compact structure, right? As, as evidenced by this lower slope, this 0.2 slope here uh, in this plot, whereas the, the alginate is, is more, more likened to a random coil, right? With a higher slope, okay? So this pectin must be you know, highly branched or otherwise you know, very compact in solution. Now, is this all we can do? You know, is, is this the only tool in our arsenal? Well, fortunately, much of, uh, of the range of these uh, materials is large enough. In other words, these samples are, are perfectly in range for light scattering work. Remember uh, from a few slides ago, only when the sample's larger than 10 nanometers do we have a measurable radius by light scattering, okay? So fortunately, these samples have a lot of content that's above 10 nanometers, and so they are sizable by light scattering. Um, but what if they're smaller? Well, the viscometer is a way around it, and I want to give a little attention to the viscometer, the ViscoStar 3. Um, earlier, I slighted viscosity when I was talking about bulk viscometry, um, so I do want to be sure to differentiate this approach from a bulk viscometer. The, the instrument on the screen is not a bulk viscometer. Um, the instrument on the screen, the ViscoStar, is intended for downstream work with chromatography only um, to measure specific viscosity, which can be used uh, to, to calculate the intrinsic viscosity of our sample. The key here is that this particular instrument is a very special inline viscometer among other uh, viscometers. You know, this, in fact, this instrument itself represents the only meaningful advancement in differential viscometry instrumentation probably since late in the in the last century um, you know, this this instrument in particular has a range and a stability and a sensitivity that 
that make subtleties in, in, in our samples able to be measured that, that previously were not. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip a lot of the, the technical, you know, reason for that, and I'll refer you to another webinar that was given by Dr. Stephen Trainoff and, and Dr. Stepan Podzimek um, that really cracks open what this ViscoStar 3 is capable of doing. Um, this, uh, this webinar is available on demand. Um, but again, if you're looking at lower molecular weight polymers in, in particular, um, let's say polymers that extend down below that 10 nanometer size, so you know under 100 kilodaltons in molecular weight, this technique is really uh, worth reviewing in, in particular. Um, and for those of us looking at larger polymers, uh, we also would benefit from this uh, viscometer because you get a second read on 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 size uh, and size related characteristics with this instrument. So the the ViscoStar is a, a very very helpful tool for for really all of us looking at these polymers. The other thing about it, and and I'll and I'll end it here, is that the the ViscoStar is more robust than any other inline viscometer. Um, those of us who have tried working in water, for example, especially salty buffers um, where you know corrosion can be a, a problem, um, this instrument has specifically been designed to handle some of these more aggressive uh, buffers and, and salty conditions where the, the hardware might actually be damaged by running these mobile phases. So, um, you know, if, for those of you who might have written off viscometry for these reasons that, you know, the instrument won't survive the chromatography, uh, it may be time to take another look. But, um, you know, the Mark Helwink plot is one of the most popular uh, uses of this intrinsic viscosity data plotted against, you know, molar mass or molecular weight. And, you know, for these two samples, we see the slope of the Mark Helwink plot actually changing with molecular weight, right? So you can see this slope flattening out at higher molecular weights, suggesting that we have a structural change going on um, that, that's carrying over different molecular weights. The amount of branching is actually increasing with increasing molecular weight for these samples. So this is the type of thing we can get uh, from, from the viscount in particular. You know, going back to the molecular weight itself, um, a lot of us, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the in the webinar here, a lot of us are really focused on molecular weight alone, and, and that's enough. Um, I, I want to go through one of the, the tools in the software that I've personally found to be very, very helpful looking at these uh, polymer molecular weight distributions. Um, and that's this molecular weight distribution analysis procedure. So those of you who are familiar with Astra, you have this distribution analysis. If you're not using this tool, uh, you might you might take a note here. Uh, we can bin the molecular weights. We can we can you know put different portions of our sample into these uh, into these counting bins, and and see what we've got. So let's look. I'll I'll first put uh, you know a detailed analysis on everything under 500 kilodaltons. And you can you can manually I, in, in this view I manually typed in you know 500,000 and zero uh, to create this bin. You know another way that folks will do this is they'll you know just draw it by hand. That's possible. Just you know click and drag, or you can use a, a low and a high cutoff. So you could say give give me the lowest 50% of my sample by mass, or give me the lowest 10% or you know, the lowest 90%. So the D10, D50, D90 analysis, what have you. In any case, however you draw this. Uh, or create this bin, you'll end up with the the start and stop molecular weight, the start and stop you know high low mass percent, uh, cumulative mass percent, and the different molecular weight averages for this subset of your sample. And you can do the same on the high end. So I just arbitrarily chose another region, everything over uh, 1.5 million. Okay, and so we see that everything over a million and a half was was seven percent of the sample. Um, and everything under 500,000 was, you know, what, 45, 46% of the sample. This was a cellulose that we ran. Um, the beauty of this is, you know, since these distributions are so critical, um, you know, to the, to the analysis of these samples, using the data and reporting the data um, are, are really important. And the 
Astra report designer tool. So if you go to any report in Astra, uh, beginning with Astra 6 and later especially, um, just click the report designer and you can add and remove these various fields. So you can see I, I made those two bins in the distribution analysis. And when I went to the report designer, I just checked the box to add these two to the report. I can put my company logo up here and, and any other number of, of, of different you know, results or numbers from the, from the analysis. And I can make my custom one page report, print it out, send it out, good to go. So um, you know, I, I, I would encourage you to, uh, to try these features in the software if you haven't already and give us a call or, or give the support team a call if you, uh, if you have a question or, or would like to go a little deeper into this. Um, it, what you end up with is once you really get to know the tools in the software, it makes data interpretation like what we have on the screen here very, very easy to do. Um, you, you might be familiar with HPMC. Um, we had this, this relatively recent study um, by uh, Arun Jain. He's directly relating hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose in vivo erosion rates to the molecular weight. Okay. And I mean, this is a stunning result. I mean, this is just like we were talking about earlier, the, the mass percent of high molecular weight HPMC, as he defined in his study, um, clearly having an effect on, on the erosion rate. Um, the, you know, the, this is making it so that the delivery of these active drug substances uh, can be tuned to a, a particular delivery time span, and so therefore to different parts of the GI tract, right? just by manipulating the molecular weight and, and the molecular weight blend of the polymers used. Um, it's that high molecular weight content again that, that seems to be driving this. Um, so we have to use light scattering and, and you know, the FDA knows this and it's what the FDA wants to see as well in our, in our data. Um, here's another look at the branching, uh, branching studies that we can do. Um, here's CMC, carboxymethylcellulose, and uh, we've done SEC MALS, you know, GPC MALS analysis with the Visco Star 3 in line. And we see that this sample is composed of, you know, two different cellulose populations, right? We have this, um, this linear low molecular weight population here with a steeper slope. And then we have a more highly branched, uh, higher molecular weight uh, subpopulation up here. And so by relating the intrinsic viscosity to the molar mass, we can really get at this, at this information. If you'd like to see more of this, or if you'd like to learn more about this analysis and some of the other numbers that we can calculate uh, for branched polymers, I'd refer you to this uh, webinar called Branching Revealed. Uh, this was given by uh, Dr. Podzimek some time ago. It is available on demand. And, you know, he goes through some some very detailed theory and, and mathematics of, of branching analysis and, and plenty more examples. I do want to go back to the alginate because I promised that we would um, take another look at that late eluding uh, material. You know, and, and the real question on, on my mind and, and probably on, on a lot of our minds is why? You know, why is this late eluding polymer coming out here? Why, why didn't the high molecular weight polymer come out over here with the rest of the high molecular weight polymer. Um, we, we see that some of these polymers and in particular branched polymers um, present really unique challenges in chromatography. Um, it, whether or not we have a light scattering detector in line because we have an anchoring effect. Um, we have this cute little cartoon of, of the anchor here. But we have this anchoring effect of, of again, branch polymers in particular uh, finding their way through a column. And the, the mechanics of this are pretty intriguing. It, what, it, it's been proposed that what's happening is that certain arms of, of the polymer um, are getting, you know, stuck, if you will, uh, in, in a part of the uh, packing, right? Um, large branch molecules are becoming anchored in the pores and delaying their elution. So we have in your typical uh, elution, you have some, you know, the large molecules eluding first, but um, after a time, some of the anchored polymer comes out 
later when it sort of wiggles its way out and finds its way out. But by that time, the low molecular weight uh, polymers have also found their way through the column and we have co-elution of these, of these materials. And so we have to be very, very careful um, when we're dealing with you know, this portion of the chromatogram um, because we know that the molecular weight of this uh, low molecular weight uh, part of the, of the peak has been tainted by the high molecular weight of the, of the larger branched polymers that had become anchored previously. We have to be really, really careful about that. Um, an alternative to the chromatography, so if we want to avoid this problem altogether, um, is field flow fractionation. And Dr. Algren uh, goes through a lot of the details of FFF in his webinar, uh, which is also available on demand. The, uh, the key takeaways are that, you know, I mean, basically, we, we try, right? We try chromatography first, always, um, because if the SEC works, you know, we're good to go. Um, but if a suitable column can't be found, this FFF might be a good alternative for us. And, and the advantages are the, the range. You know, we have this very, very wide separation range available to us with FFF. Um, and it is programmable. So instead of swapping out different columns or different channels, we can just we can just tune the flow rate to whatever we need based on the size of, of our analytes. Um, and the beautiful thing is, is in FFF, as you'll learn, there's no stationary phase. Essentially, there's there's really no place for those large branched polymers to become anchored uh, because it's an open space through which uh, this, this separation process happens. So we don't have shearing forces, we don't have anchoring forces. It's a much cleaner way to do the separation. And so with the goal of taking the, the GPC separation that was not so good um, and using FFF uh, to, to obtain a cleaner separation, you know, here we are, right? And so we have this beautiful uh, separation. We don't have that entanglement problem uh, when we use FFF, okay? Um, note the FFF, of course, has the opposite elution order. The, uh, we expect in field flow fractionation for the smaller molecules to elute first and for the larger molecules to elute later. That is that is the process of FFF separation. So other than that, the field flow um, feels a lot like size exclusion chromatography in terms of the, you know, the duration of the run might be a little longer, um, but otherwise uh, we use the same inline detectors and, and so forth. So I would encourage you to take a look at that. For further study, um, this text is fantastic. Um, field flow fractionation, or sorry, light scattering, size exclusion chromatography, and asymmetric flow, field flow fractionation. Great application examples and real world examples of uh, polymer, protein, and nanoparticle separations. Um, the, the text is, is uh, covering in great detail. It's very, it's comprehensive, uh, very well written. You might screen capture this slide. Here are a few of our uh, featured publications that might be of particular interest um, to us. You know, again, looking at polymeric excipients in particular. You know, we literally have thousands of peer-reviewed articles referenced on, on the Wyatt website. Um, I did a quick free text search on cellulose earlier today and you know, netted a couple hundred hits or more on that topic alone. Now, again, these are articles that are you know published journal articles that are known to involve Wyatt instruments. Um, I also did a Google Scholar search, and uh, I mean I, I netted you know a couple thousand hits, uh, including Wyatt light scattering um, and and cellulose uh, in the in the search terms. So there's a lot out there. Um, this is this is what folks are doing. Um, you know, plenty again, plenty of resources on the website, including you know, polymer characterization theory, that bibliography I was just talking about, some of those other webinars, theory. We have a great bank of technical notes. So for those of you who are, are you know currently using a Wyatt instrument, um, I would encourage you to log into the support center. Any anyone with a current Wyatt instrument um, will be able to log into our support center and uh, and take a look at our technical notes, which which is an just an ever-growing fantastic resource uh, for our users.
you know, and one more thing, there's always that one more thing, right? Um, the, the hardware is award winning. Um, Wyatt has made it really easy, if not fun uh, and enjoyable for us, uh, so much so that the, the Helios 2 uh, recently won a reviewer's choice award through Select Science, um, thanks to a vast number of positive ratings. And um, the, the overall numbers are nearly perfect in every category, you know, from ease of use to uh, value for your money after uh, service and support, you know, after delivery service and support. Um, this type of thing is no accident. Um, this is a key reason for a lot of our customers' successes in the lab is that the instruments work um, and they're, they're enjoyable to use. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, thank our hosts, and I'm sure we have plenty of time for questions. I'm going to grab a, a quick sip of water here. Well, thank you, Andy, for that excellent presentation. We now have time for questions submitted by the Ask a Question button. So Andy, I hope you've had that sip of water now. And our first question today is, I've heard you can combine GPC with differential viscometry to measure molecular weight. How does that technique compare with MALS? Oh, what a great question. Um, you know, it's interesting when you look at these detectors and what they do, um, you know, a, a light scattering detector measures light scattering, okay, and a viscometer measures viscosity. So the the issue of trying to take a, a viscometer and, and measure viscosity and turn that into a molecular weight is a, is a tricky proposition. And I would, I think the easiest way to answer this question is to say that there, there are probably two categories of you know, polymer analytical challenges that we face. You know, in, in one case, you know, we might be working with polymers that are very well behaved, linear polymers, you know, very well characterized known structures. And in that case, you might actually be able to do what this question is asking. You might actually be able to take a, a viscosity measurement and turn that into a molecular weight. Uh, by virtue of some very well-known and well-established coefficient. Uh, that, that might actually work. For the case where you have a polymer where, you know, it, it's a novel polymer, or there may be some branching issues or some, some conformational unknowns or maybe some behavioral unknowns in solution, I, I would not be comfortable trying to turn a viscosity into a molecular weight in such a case. Um, this is the strength, this is the, the confidence that a light scattering detector gives us, is that when we measure the light scattering, and I, I showed that in an early slide, fairly early on in the presentation, you measure the absolute amount of light scattering, and that number is directly related to molecular weight, regardless of the degree of branching, regardless of the conformation of the polymer in solution. So in terms of trying to compare these two techniques, um, I, I, I would argue that there really isn't a, is not a comparison, that the viscometer is going to give you a viscosity, and armed with that viscosity, you might or might not be able to alley-oop to a molecular weight. Um, I have seen very, very few cases where that uh, calculation uh, renders truly. Um, in most cases, we feel far more confident um, actually measuring the molecular weight directly with light scattering. Okay, thank you, Andy. Uh, we have another question, which is, if considering field flow fractionation, what are some concerns to be aware of compared to GPC? Oh, good. Okay. So looking at FFF, um, you know, with with field flow fractionation, you, you know, as we talked about, you you don't have the complications of the column. But there are still some issues that we should probably be aware of um, with regard to the channel. And so, in other words, when you look at the FFF channel, we do have that semi-permeable membrane. Um, and that is, you know, an, an area of, of concern. We want to make sure that our polymer doesn't stick to that membrane. Um, and we certainly need to be sure that uh, that membrane will survive in our solvent. Right, so I suppose in, in a in a broad sense, you know, with with chromatography with with GPC, you can use a, a much wider range of solvents 
uh, than you currently can with field flow fractionation, just because of solvent compatibility issues. Um, so I would say that the number one issue would probably be um, if you are thinking that FFF might be for you, check with us regarding what solvents you'd like to use. Um, you know, certainly aqueous solvents, alcohols, toluene, THF, these are some of the stalwarts that we have definitely done uh, very successful work with in FFF. Um, some other solvents may be may be difficult, if not impossible, for FFF. So that's probably the number one concern. And then, again, as I mentioned, uh, compatibility with the, the FFF membrane is another concern. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. We have another question here, which is um, just a question about uh, FFF. I've been told that molecules below 10 kilodaltons are much more difficult to do by FFF, but you have uh, down to one nanometer that this technique is effective. Um, can you go further than? Uh, can you go further into this? Oh right. Okay. So this is related to the previous question. Um, that hey, absolutely. So that that membrane uh, that we have in the FFF channel, you know, its job is to keep your sample in the separation channel, right? That's the that's the that's the purpose of that membrane. And um, this is a really well thought out question because if you have uh, samples, uh, if your polymer molecules are actually smaller than the pore size of the membrane in the channel, <laughs> then the sample will just go right through the membrane and we'll be left with nothing. So we do have to be uh, very prudent about selecting a membrane whose pore size is, you know, small enough that our sample doesn't actually go through it, right? The, the, again, the purpose of the membrane is to support the sample, not to allow the sample to go through. Um, and so we do, you know, fortunately, we do have choices of different membranes. Um, the 10 kilodalton membrane, that was the, the question that was asked, the 10 kilodalton membrane is probably the most popular. Um, they're easy to come by. They, you know, perform very well in terms of pressure and, and stability and so forth. Um, but there are lower cutoff membranes that are available and that are commonly used. Uh, 5 kilodalton, 3 kilodalton. I've heard of folks even using uh, smaller uh, pore sizes than those, um, but uh, I mean, that's the, that's the simple answer to the question. To expand further, we'd we'd love to chat with you about your precise application, and seeing what we can do to ensure that the FFF works for your samples. So, Andy, the next question we have is: Is MAL useful for characterizing polymers that cannot be separated by GPC or FFF? Oh yes, good question. So, yes, uh, we can use a light scattering detector, um, even in those cases where, um, you know, GPC is not an option. And for the reasons that <laughs> we were just chatting about, that, uh, that FFF may not be an option, um, all hope is not lost, right? So we can run a light scattering detector in what we might call a batch mode. Um, where we might take uh, just a syringe full of our sample solution and load it directly into the instrument, you know, by hand or, or, or by some sort of a syringe pump or other injector device. Um, we also have the option of using a scintillation vial, uh, just the standard, you know, scintillation vial or a, a small volume cuvette. We have a micro cuvette option. And the, the idea here is, you know, look, we might have polymers of very, very large molecular weight um, that that simply will not get through a GPC column and for some reason will not behave on an FFF channel. And there is still information to be had by light scattering. Um, this is this batch approach has actually become quite popular among folks who are looking at some very ultra high molecular weight materials uh, for these reasons. And Wyatt even has a, a device, it's called the Calypso. Um, or <laughs> it's funny, the Calypso wasn't actually originally invented or intended for this purpose, but it has become very popular for this purpose of making the infusion of these batch polymer uh, solutions in, directly into the instrument, making these infusions very easy to do and, and semi-automated. Um, so you just have one concentration of your polymer and you load it in the Calypso and it can actually introduce it into the MALS instrument and does the calculations of molecular weight 
and the construction of a ZIM plot. We did not discuss ZIM plots in this presentation. Uh, that's Z-I-M-M, -M, uh, the ZIM plot. But uh, these are these are very popular uh, instruments for the use of, uh, of characterizing these very, very high molecular weight polymers. So yes, the, the short answer to the question is MALS is definitely useful for characterizing polymers that you know, will not be separated by GPC or FFF, and we use this Calypso or other uh, other batch techniques like a scintillation vial uh, to do that. The other the other concern sometimes for folks is that they're worried that infusing their sample into the instrument may, you know, somehow harm the sample, uh, somehow harm the the flow cell. So in other words, what if my polymer is known to stick to glass or to interact with the quartz or some other wetted material inside the instrument? Again, this is a great opportunity for a, you know, a 10 cent scintillation vial, which actually yields surprisingly good data quality um, to be quite useful. We can load our, our dirty or sticky solution into uh, a scintillation vial and take a quick measurement in the instrument. Um, it just adds another dimension of what this, this technique can do for you when when you're not locked into you know one mode or the other you're not locked into batch mode or gpc you're getting you know two or three different instruments in one thank you very much andy uh, our next question is is this sec miles technique suitable for protein and biomolecule separations oh sure um so that's a little off of the topic of this um, presentation, but of course, yes, um, we have a great number of, of users, and oh my gosh, if you look at the literature, um, folks that are running you know, various proteins or other biomolecules on GPC or FFF or in batch mode, as we've just discussed, um, the, the SEC MALS technique um, applies to essentially any macromolecule or particle that can be separated by SEC, um, we can also characterize by MALS. Um, let's talk. Uh, if you have, if you have non-polymer samples that you'd like to characterize with light scattering, there's a resounding yes uh, that, that this works uh, for those, those proteins and those biomolecules, and we'd be happy to, to chat with you about that. Okay. Our next question is, how does MALS compare to low angle laser light scattering for polymer characterization? Oh, <laughs> so, so low angle uh, laser light scattering. Um, oh my gosh, where to begin? So low angle laser light scattering was used 50, 60 years ago when, when light scattering was, was literally in its infancy and we didn't have computers that could collect simultaneous data from from multiple angles um, we were at that time in, in this field we were limited to basically the, the computing capability you know what what could be done so low angle laser light scattering uh, is is what was done <laughs> in the in the in the mid 1900 you know the 1950s I suppose and, and and 60s you know before computers came along um, so how they compare from a historical standpoint is, you know, low angle light scattering is, I suppose, where we got our, our start with this technology. Um, when computers came along and we learned that we could collect, you know, more than one angle of data at a time, that was really the watershed moment for this technology. Um, you know, low angle light scattering is, is fraught with challenges, mostly due to noise. Um, Again, in one of the earlier slides, uh, we talked about the angular dependence of light scattering. And as it turns out, one of the dominant sources of noise in any light scattering measurement uh, is you know, stray dust or other very, very small amounts of particles that may be floating around in solution. And these foreign particles scatter light very, very strongly in the low angles, um, especially the, the very low angles. And these old low angle laser light scattering instruments uh, from days gone by um, attempted to approximate the zero angle scattering uh, by measuring very close to zero angle. And it was difficult to get those to work because of the noise. Um, in, in certain cases, you know, where we had, you know, what, what today we would consider unrealistically clean uh, solutions, it could work, but um, 
the beauty is with the multi-angle light scattering detector, we don't have to collect data down there at zero. Um, we collect data across the entire spec, you know, across the, the entire uh, angular array uh, around the flow cell. And the idea is by, by collecting data across the entire light scattering fingerprint of the molecule, we can understand very confidently the size and the molecular weight uh, of, of these polymers. And the beauty is, is we, we're not uh, beholden to the noise issues that happen at very, very, very low angle. So MALS gives us better precision um, and far less exposure to noise than the low, ang low angle laser light scattering uh, technique. In a, in a previous life, I had a, a two angle light scattering detector. And the low angle of that detector was positioned, as I recall, at about seven degrees. And we never obtained any useful data at seven degrees. Um, the only even reasonably you know, useful data came at 90 degrees, but then at that point we didn't have malls. So again, it was, it was a tough, it was tough sledding with effectively an only a, a one angle detector. Um, so I would say to answer the question briefly, the, um, how does MALS compare to low angle light scattering? I don't think there is a comparison um, just because there's so much more that we can do with MALS that we, uh, that we just can't do with a low angle detector. Okay, thank you, Andy. Uh, we have another question, which is, can MALS characterize core polymers? Oh, sure. Yes. Um, the copolymer analysis that we do, um, essentially, what, what we're looking at is there are these, the, you know, in a copolymer, you have you know, monomer A and monomer B, and we, we seek to exploit the difference between the, the amount, the, the mass amount of, of monomer A and monomer B, and we, we do that by using different UV absorptivities. So if we have a copolymer for which one monomer is UV absorptive or strongly UV absorptive at a, at a particular UV wavelength, and, and where the other monomer is, let's say, UV invisible, and then we also use a refractive index detector, which would, of course, be sensitive to both uh, monomers, um, we can very easily uh, measure the concentration of each uh, mer in, in our copolymer. And uh, combining that with the light scattering data, we can then calculate the molecular weight of component A and component B. So it's really slick if, if you're in this scenario where you can choose a UV wavelength um, you know, to, to exploit the, the absorptivities of the two, uh, the two monomers then we can actually take, say, a, a 100 kilodalton copolymer, just, just some theoretical example, um, and we can say, yeah, you know, 60 kilodaltons worth of that 100 kilodaltons is, is monomer A and 40 kilodaltons is monomer B. Um, we have technical notes and other webinars that go into that uh, calculation in, in much greater depth, but um, I, would love to, uh, I, I would love to refer you to those um, for, for lack of time here. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. Uh, our next question is, can you explain a little bit more about uh, multi-angle data and how it helps in terms of characterizing polymers as compared to evaporative light scattering detection? Oh, right. So evaporative detectors are typically just used as concentration detectors, um, where you might um, have your liquid flowing into the evaporative detector and the solvent is blown off and um, and the light scattering detector is essentially it's it's a yes no reading you know is, is something there um, so you wouldn't expect uh, to obtain a molecular weight from an, an evaporative light scattering detector it's again just typically used as a concentration detector okay thank you very much Andy and I think the final question we have today is how can DNDC be measured for a polymer. Oh, good. Yes. So we do need to have a DNDC. Um, this is this DNDC value again is the uh, differential. Uh, I'm sorry, the specific refractive index increment. Uh, the DNDC. So the N stands for refractive index, and the C stands for concentration. So the specific refractive index increment um, is required in order to um, solve for molecular weight for your polymer. 
And uh, so the question is, can it be measured? Yes, it can be measured. Um, we see in that term itself, the dn over dc, um, it's, the, it's relating the change in refractive index of the polymer solution with concentration. So by uh, a couple of different methods, we can, we can inject polymer solution in our solvent into a refractometer and measure this DNDC value. There are a couple of different ways to do it. Um, you know, sort of the, the, the straightforward way is to prepare several concentrations of our polymer in our solvent and infuse them one at a time into the RI detector and plot the change in refractive index with concentration. Uh, the slope of that line uh, is then the DNDC value. Um, and that's tedious. Um, you know, it takes some time and, and the, the prep work uh, can be challenging. Those concentrations really have to be prepare, prepared very, very precisely. So um, a lot of folks prefer a DNDC measurement that's just, you know, easier to do and faster to do. And, you know, one of my favorites is to make a normal injection of my polymer on a GPC line and integrate the peak to measure DNDC. Now, how is that done? Um, and, and again, there, there are some tech notes that we offer that, that go into this in greater detail. But in short, if we know the concentration of our polymer injected onto the column, uh, ahead of time. So we know we know how much concentration, you know, how much total polymer mass is represented under the RI peak uh, ahead of time. Um, and if we can assume that everything that we inject does cleanly elute off of the column, you know, so every, you know, every microgram of sample that we inject actually manifests in that one nice beautiful peak at the end. Um, if we if we can assume that, then we can actually just calculate the DNDC directly because we can integrate the area under the peak by RI to have the N number. And we already know the C number, the concentration, uh, the, you know, the total mass number. And so we can actually calculate DNDC on the fly uh, in, in GPC mode with, again, it's, it's sort of no extra work uh, involved. It's just a calculation. There's no extra wet chemistry involved. So with one normal GPC injection, we can, uh, calculate DNDC on the fly if we're willing to assume that all of our polymer does elude off of the column cleanly and uh, and if we know the the concentration of our injected polymer to begin with. Um, one quick point about all this, um, just be very careful if you are going to do DNDC measurements um, in your lab. A couple of things, or uh, three things. The first is the wavelength. Uh, be sure that the wavelength of the RI detector that you're using um, is the same as the wavelength of the light scattering detector that you'll be using. Uh, the DNDC is a wavelength specific parameter, right? So we really want to be sure that we're measuring DNDC at a relevant wavelength. Uh, the second is the solvent. Um, we want to make sure, you know, the DNDC is a solvent specific parameter. So, um, you know, be, be sure to measure DNDC in the same solvent that you're going to be using for the GPC work. Um, and uh, in terms of the third issue uh, for, for DNDC measurements, um, in, in some organic liquids, there, there can be trouble with uh, dissolved gases and water uh, getting into the solvent in between the measurements. Um, we see in some of these um, you know, hygroscopic um, solvents like THF is, is really tricky with DNDC measurements that the online DNDC measurement uh, that I was talking about, sort of the one injection method, uh, tends to be far more reliable. Whereas the offline, you know, single injection uh, method, you know, one at a time, multiple injection uh, mode is what I meant to say there. Uh, the multiple injection mode can be a little unwieldy because each of those individual solutions may have different exposure to air and different exposure to water vapor. And so there can be a lot of uncertainty introduced in those refractive index measurements with water content and with gas content. Again, we have um, some tech notes that really go into great detail and, and help help you to build your experimental design for a successful DNDC measurement. And uh, I would encourage you to take a look at the, the Wyatt Support Center for some of those materials. Well, once again, Andy, thank you very much for your presentation today. 
Thank you also to our scientific partners in this webinar, being Wyatt Technology, for all their technical input and support. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for logging in and listening. Thank you, and goodbye.